judge rejects a claim that New York's marijuana licensing cheats out-of-state applicants, you guys. That's right. A federal judge has rejected a challenge to New York State's licensing program for selling legal marijuana, a system two California applicants say unconstitutionally discriminates against out-of-state residents. The ruling on Friday by Albany Judge Annie M. Nardaki uh, may spur New York into issuing hundreds of licenses in a state where most marijuana is sold by unlicensed businesses. Naradaki said the public interest in letting properly licensed businesses take over the market in New York outweighed concerns raised in the lawsuit. She said the main purpose of the d uh, Dormant Commerce Clause, plaintiffs argued, should allow them to access New York's market doesn't apply to the federally illegal cannabis trade. The clause is supposed to uh, stop states from creating protectionist measures to restrict interstate commerce in the absence of rules from Congress. Two companies controlled by Los Angeles residents had sought to temporarily restraining uh, a temporary restraining order, better known as a TRO, and preliminary injunction in their mid-December lawsuit. They aim to stall the state's licensing process while the lawsuit proceeded. Naradaki rejected the request in a written ruling, saying in an injunction would follow the illicit store operators who now control the market to continue dominating it as the rollout of regulated licenses to sell cannabis products would be delayed. A lawyer for the plaintiff did not immediately respond to requests Sunday for comment, and New York State Attorney General Letitia James, I wonder if that is that the same lady that's prosecuting Trump? said in a statement that she was oh, pleased yeah. with the court's decision. Of course she was pleased with the court's decision. In a quote, this is an important victory in our efforts to ensure that disproportionately impact communities are given their fair share in legal cannabis industry, James said. The state launched uh, launched this program in October, saying it intended to grant many of the first licenses to individuals with past drug convictions, and the system was meant to offer people harmed by the war on drugs a chance to succeed in the market before competitors rushed in. Lawyers for the state argued that over 1,000 retail storefronts were expected to be licensed this year, and they maintain that the state's application process allows out-of-state residents to prove that they reside in an area disproportionately impacted by cannabis cannabis prohibition. The moves were expected to boost the number of legal dispensaries in a market dominated by the black market sellers who simply operated retail stores without a license, and critics blame New York's slow retail growth partly on bureaucratic issues like delays in setting up a $200 million social equity fund that never came to fruition and help applicants open shops. The rollout also was uh, hobbled by lawsuits on behalf of people and businesses excluded from the first wave of retail licenses. Well, 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 well. I wonder if this thing is going to stand, and I'm pretty sure that these guys will bring this up to appeal to a higher court or whatnot, but I'm going to digress, and I want to hear what y'all have to say because New York is just one hot mess. And this is Jason Beck for the High at 9 News. What do y'all think about this? I mean, I would like to make a recommendation that we stop covering New York stories until New York figures their shit out. Just saying. That's, I mean, I, I love New York. I love hot messes. <laughs> you love New York, too, point, but you yeah. guys do have a lot of things going on right now that uh, got to get worked through. Now, mm -hmm. forgive me if I'm wrong, but this is painted as her saying, like, like her being the bad guy, not letting out-of-state people in on this industry. But is it really her just saying that she wants people who have been impacted by prohibition first and then the rest of the people can come in? No, 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 story? no. Because the, these is, to, from my understanding, these people that filed the lawsuit were hurt by prohibition, but they were hurt by prohibition in Los Angeles. And they're saying that that they have a right to apply for these social equity licenses because um, there have uh, already been numerous rulings saying that state can't uh, <laughs> can't create restrictions on out of state applicants. And so I think right. that this is probably going to get rechallenged in, 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 in a higher court. Because I don't think that the judge, because it seems like the judge stri strictly ruled on this based on the fact that uh, that the illicit market has taken over New York and in an effort for them to open up more licensed retailers. So it doesn't seem like it's 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 codified by any type of uh, judicial credence, so to say. It's just based off of the fact that they want to open up more retail stores in a timely manner. Every everybody We've seen these kinds of things. The shit out of uh, New New York uh, cannabis. Mm -hmm. uh, these are people like out of California that are suing them. Yeah, Los Angeles. <laughs> it says. Yeah. I'm not I mean, mad at this. We've seen these kinds of things. We've seen these kinds of things get shot down. I mean, I, I'm sorry. We've seen these kinds of attacks on policy 
where mm-hmm. there's bans on people from outside the area be successful in other markets. And my prediction is that they will be able to get this because there's this notion that it affects commerce and this and that and the other. The thing is, is that the historic legacy market was national. There'd be no Brooklyn without Mendocino. There'd be no Humboldt without the tri-state area. And so there was a level of cooperation and interdependency that would lead me to believe that, yeah, you might be able to hail from that borough or that borough, but at the end of the day, I like the notion that Luke brought up, which is like, okay, if you're justice involved, let's look at prioritizing justice involved in a way that gives some preference to those who help pave the way without being so zip code focused. Mm -hmm. We like to use the term justice impacted. Justice mm-hmm. impact. Yeah, and 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 I agree with you, Yaro. I I've, I don't think people should get social equity grants strictly on a zip code. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't believe in that. I don't I don't believe that just because you lived in a certain part of the city that you were impacted negatively by cannabis. I know people that had no dealings with cannabis, law enforcement, or anything, and they've lived in the worst part of the cities. Mm-hmm. So. We have to we have to craft these programs to be more focused on people who were impacted. Now, of course, mm-hmm. that is going to be in parts of the city. There, it's going to be predominantly in parts of the city that we're trying to help, right? But that's not only the factor. And I think when we say, okay, if you're from nine five three five five and you automatically qualify for social equity, well, there could be a large amount of people in there that have nothing to do with social equity that are now going to get put in front of the line to someone else who perhaps is from Nevada, but Mm -hmm. was impacted on a a federal system and served 20 years for cannabis. Somebody from 95355 has nothing on their record, has no kind of impact. They get ahead of the line of that person. Now, that doesn't seem right to me. Do I have the answers to that? No, but it just on the face value doesn't seem right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, you, what were you going to say, Yarrow? I was just going to say, I think the challenge and what this notion of zip codes, disproportionately impacted areas, et cetera, was attempting to try to address is the idea that prohibition affected black and brown communities more than, and, and communities of poverty, but certainly communities that were black and brown and indigenous in ways that was much, much greater. And so we know that race-based programs are gonna get rolled back through litigation and, and challenges. And so the, the the disproportionately impacted area was this way of trying to come up with uh, a non-color or race-based policy that ideally tried to achieve the same things, which was to give priority to communities that have been most affected. Yeah, so Yaro. like Luke, I don't have the solution. And like Luke, I can't tell you what the better approach is, but, I, but like Luke, I agree that there's some real gaps in how that actually is playing out and whether that's actually helping the people who deserve to have a head start. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I mean, but Yaro, don't you think that it could just be based on the fact of people having uh, 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 past convictions? I mean, wouldn't that wouldn't that just make it a whole lot easier? Just saying, the only way you can apply for social equity is if you have a past conviction. Yeah, but then what about the stepson of somebody, or what about the what about the aunt of somebody? You know, so so it, it should probably extend out into the families of people who've had past convictions. I, and then there's I'm not necessarily I'm not necessarily like for all that. One removed, one removed, child or parent, That's- like immediately impacted. You know yep. what I'm saying? Not like three, st- three, three generations down the line. It could be like your biological child, your stepchild that you raised and were. If you if, if you have involved. financial responsibility for that child, you're saying, man. right? Yeah. And this is also. Let I'm me, saying let that, me that those those prisoners, are it affected families, and so yes, I, I agree. If it's your second cousin three times removed who lives in. You know that's different, but but it but it but the war on drugs did affect families for sure. A hundred percent. I don't think anyone's trying to discredit discredit that 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 it that it disproportionately affected a large number but of families across just, the country. We talk about yeah, sorry. We talk about this all the time, but social justice and and um, social equity are not the same thing. They are not the same thing in mm-hmm. this industry. And when we talk about social justice reform, and we talk about 
becoming eligible for licensure and and being able to get back on the track of creating some kind of wealth for your family or looking at those have been those that have been directly or one generation removed impacted by the justice efforts in enforcing not having access to this plant. So if you are a child or a stepchild of someone or a direct parent, like that makes absolute sense. And I'm not talking even if you serve time, I'm talking about if you were charged for anything, mm -hmm. your life was impacted at some point. You had to hire a lawyer, you had to go to court, you had to do all these things. Even if you were found innocent, it was still a massive burden to you. You well, that's an interesting perspective, Mandy. That's very interesting. If you're saying you're saying that as long as you were charged in a crime, whether whether you got a conviction or not, you're saying if you were charged with yeah, a crime. Yeah, conviction should be irrelevant. The charge in and of itself is a burden. I, I mean, I, I agree, agree with her going through the. I agree. Slope. You agree with that, Yarl? I do agree situation. with that because going through the criminal going through the criminal justice system is a sentence in and of itself. Mm -hmm. The uncertainty mm -hmm. and ambiguity, the time away from work, having to dress up, peeing your pants your even before, after, or during your court appearance, not getting to be able to go to sleep at night, having that one family member say, "I told you so." I mean, it is it is not it is not a zero consequence process. And so the notion no, that it would have to rest not. on a conviction, it's too, it's too narrow. Mm -hmm. uh, Absolutely. I mean, listen, I, I have had a situation where my bank account was completely levied and I never got that money back. I, I never was, I've had that happen. I never was found guilty for anything. I just never saw that money again. Yeah. I mean, they still take money. And it was life changing. Account. Like it was a life changing amount of money. Mm hmm. I believe that. Um, Matthew, I mean, there's, there's a lot of there's a lot of different ways, Jay, to be impact to be justice impacted, and that, yeah. and it absolutely does have to extend to, I would say, at least the immediate family. You know, because you have situations like, for for example, you have Robert Deals, who's an Air Force veteran who's serving a 18 year sentence in federal prison right now. Mm -hmm. His daughter is on the street right now. She's mm -hmm. looking to be involved in the industry, so. Under certain rules, Robert Deal's daughter wouldn't be able to qualify for social equity under certain states because it's not her who was directly impacted, mm -hmm. right? But I would argue that Robert Deal's daughter and the daughters of any parent who has been incarcerated behind cannabis, those children actually serve the heavier burden of the sentence. Mm -hmm. Like, listen, we are grown adults. We go into prison, we make our decisions, we're responsible for what we do, we, we handle our business, whatever. The kids didn't make those choices. Mm -hmm. And they have to go through daddy-daughter day and recitals and all these things without their mom, without their dad. And they have to navigate life and they often end up back into, in the the, in, into the system. It's a vicious cycle of mass incarceration that ends up happening. And that is the part that has to stop because if we only focus on one minor part of the person who has been impacted and we don't look at all the collateral people and all the peripheral people that have been impacted by that person's life. And I'm, and of course we can't just go all the way, like you said, third cousins and, and, and all that nonsense, but Absolutely, a son or a daughter, a mom or a, or, or a brother, father, whoever, that had to really deal with the, the burden of the incarceration. I think that they absolutely should qualify for social equity. And anybody in the military, anybody in the military, I know we don't have like a lot of these programs crafted for people that get kicked out of the military or who, who uh, uh, be court-martialed into the military for, for possession of cannabis and use of cannabis. Um, I know tremendous or uh, a bunch of guys who have had that end up happening to them so my my heart goes out to them and we need to fix that too mm -hmm. because we can't just leave people who put it on the line for our country off to the side when we're talking about social equity and justice impacted because they they have been too so mm -hmm. you know that's that's my rant on the issue i'll, I'll let somebody else jump on and we're going to keep keep this rolling matthew st germain are you still with us i'm here st. Germain. all right still lives all right we're